The following Google map displayed in gmap.net shows the 6,917 fracking well sites in Pennsylvania published by fracktracker.org. The well heads are represented by a well derrick. The 4,758 blue bubbles are the published violations for these fracking sites. Using the data from fracktracker.org, I counted the occurrences of certain keywords in the spreadsheet. The more interesting words are tear, puncture, runoff, erosion, and stream. For each of these, frac water may have leaked into the ground, possibly polluting nearby ponds and streams. As frac water is processed, the slurry is radioactive and salty. It has been determined that the saltier the brine, the higher the conductivity and radioactivity. This is my gas detector. I received advice on how to build it from Dr. Ray Hicks, the president of CO2 meter. It consists of a water trap, a filter, a small pump, a K30 sensor, which detects CO2, and a COSAR sensor, which detects CO2 and volatile organic compounds. Then there's the fan, which disperses the air around the uh, half a liter box, so the sensors can read it. These are connected by USB to a laptop. And this is a check valve. This is how I calibrated the gas detector. I started with a tank of nitrogen and a half a liter per minute regulator. I turned on the regulator and the fan and I let it run for five minutes, and I used the gas lab to zero calibrate the detectors. I repeated this for 500 and 1,000 ppm methane. The material data sheet specified a safe rating for all of the tanks. This is my progeny detector. The case is from Palulo, and I drew it in Corel, then I sent it to them and they laser cut it. This is the IW Tremont radiological filter paper. This is the hole, which is the inlet for the daughter product of radon. This is the Geiger, one of the geiger muller tubes. This is the other one, which will just detect beta. These are the two Geiger counters. This is the uh, pancake motor, which will step the paper. This is the wheel encoder, which measures the amount of paper that is moved. This is the XP, which connects the computer and this. This is the Arduino Mega, which is the microcontroller, which controls everything. And there are two maker shields on it, too. One of them controls the pancake motor, and the other two, and the other one controls the two relays for the pumps. This is the 32 liter per minute pump. This is where the pump connects. This is my program Frackenstein. 
Here I can set the different COM ports and speeds for the GPS, CO2 sensor, volatile organic compound sensor, and progeny detector. The check boxes on the side allow me to either turn the different detectors on or off. And the last cycle says how many cycles there will be and since it is set to one, it will go through cycle zero, then cycle one. Cycle zero, it will suck uh, with the pump, then cycle one, it will read with the Geiger counter. Uh, the, I can set the duration for the cycles and I can set the duration for the final cycle. I can also pre-step the paper just in case there's still radioactive material on it. I will now run uh, two cycles, the sucking cycle and the reading cycle. Those were both of the cycles, but they were only run for 10 seconds. I usually ran them for five minutes, five minutes, which is 300 seconds, because uh, polonium 218's half life is three minutes. So after three minutes, half of them are gone. Half of the particles are gone. So after five, almost all of them will be. I performed a radon study of 10 homes using the progeny detector. This table shows the decay events found in the background radiation in the first 5 minute cycle. During the first cycle, radioactive de decay products are deposited onto the filter paper by the pump. As you can see, a simple Geiger counter is not enough to determine whether a home has a problem with radon. The second table shows radioactive decay events from the second cycle. Homes 2 and 8 show, a, show an unusually high number of decay events. The progeny detector quickly detected elevated radiation in a number of homes. It accomplishes this by processing a larger volume of air in a short time frame. Passive commercial detectors absorb whatever happens to stray their way. This is why they must be placed in an undisturbed basement location for days. This table shows the calculated levels of radon for each of the homes. The picocuries per liter is calculated by dividing by 300, then dividing the result using the government action guideline of 0 0.037 and finally adjusting for flow rate measured by the Honeywell flow sensor through the filter. High levels of radon were found in homes 2 and 8. Remediation for these homes should be done as soon as possible. Remediation is straightforward. You can seal the cracks and sump pumps or if the radon is high enough, you can install one or more air pumps, which pull subterranean air from under the concrete slab in the basement to the outside where the radon would immediately dilute with outdoor air. A three-day test using a commercial kit was performed in homes 2, 4, and 8. The results were 11.9, 1.7, and 4.9, respectively. Dr. Derek Lane Smith suggested that I run an extended sec second cycle in home number two. Dr. Smith says there appears to be other radioactive daughter products in this cycle. Based on the results, it appears that 
home to also has a Thoron problem. Normal radon 222 decays to polonium 218. Another form of radon is radon 220, which decays to polonium 216. With some calculus, one could determine the type of progeny from the exponential decay. In order to perform a field study, a magnetic Garmin GPS antenna is affixed to the roof of the vehicle. Upon reaching a fracking site, the progeny detector is extended from an open window on a pair of drawer slides. The inlet and outlet hose for the gas detector are attached to the progeny detector. A power cable and voltage regulator plug into the 12 volt cigarette lighter. The output of the voltage regulator powers the progeny detector and Garmin GPS antenna. The laptop is powered by a separate power inverter. The gas detector, GPS, XB transmitter, and receiver are plugged in to USB ports. The laptop runs a custom program called Frackenstein. Frackenstein controls the apparatus and writes data to a comma separate value file. The following gmap.net map shows radiation levels increase as I approach the well sites. At the final waypoint, there were no trespassing signs leading to each well. I was able to get within 1,600 feet of the well site to the left and within 2,600 feet to the well site below me. The following gmap.net map shows waypoints where the numbers represent CPM, CO2, alkane, or hydrocarbons. The blue bubbles indicate violations. The radiation increase started as I approached the fracking sedimentation pond. The Marcellus is known to have high uranium content, says U.S. Geological Survey research geologist Mark Engel. He says concentrations of radium-226, a decayed product of uranium, can exceed 10,000 picocuries per liter in the concentrated brine trapped in the shale's depth. Unfortunately, I traveled in the winter. I live in southeastern Pennsylvania and the trip was long and the roads were difficult. After visiting these two sites in northern PA, my parents decided that we shouldn't continue with the study. I recently improved both detectors. A second Geiger counter and tube have been added in order to allow me to differentiate between alpha and beta radiation. I also added a small fan in the gas detector in order to agitate the air and speed up the COSAR sensor. Yesterday, my dad drove me to the Limerick Generating Station. The picture below shows the cooling towers for the Limerick nuclear power plant from our car window. The data from the recently improved apparatus is shown in gmap.net, Google Maps, below. The map now displays the average alpha beta radiation, CO2, and alkane levels at a number of waypoints around the generating.